I know that it might not seem like we're the natural bedfellows of uh, things that you're going through, but South Africa is traditionally a very deeply Christian country. It's also a deeply conservative country, but we have had a socialist government in place that's heavily influenced by the communists since 1994 when the first elections occurred in South Africa. And with the reforms that's come through, we've seen a lot of the, should we say, left, left-wing left type agendas that are slowly making their way through the United States, influencing our country. Um, we've seen things like mm-hmm. critical race theory, uh, critical gender theory, all the critical theories really kind of making their way into South Africa and affecting some of our policies. We've even seen the introduction of social media, censoring things like the, uh, the hate speech bills and a number of other things that are we can see and we can kind of trace their origin, a lot of it through to, well, your country. So it's, yeah. it's, it's great to, to speak to somebody like you. I know you talk about a lot of this stuff quite a lot and you push against it. So I think I'd love to actually start the first question and just say, with, with, from, from our point of view, we wanted to ask, with the, with, the, with the retreat of Christian values in the West and the rise of woke kind of values that we're seeing everywhere, what, what do you think this means for for our civilizations and where are we going? Well, I think it depends on how Christians decide to respond to it. Uh, are, are we going to constantly fight a rear guard action where we're, we're just trying to mitigate losses? Are we trying to manage the retreat? Or are we preparing for a counterattack? Or, or, you know, do we, do we assume that we're in a battle that can't be won or do we assume that we're in a battle that will eventually be won and so we can be faithful either way but what what you think the possible outcomes are affects very profoundly how you engage right if if you're trying if you're just trying to uh, if you think the world is god's vietnam and we're just managing the helicopter escape of saigon <laughs> and the, and that's what we're doing, then what you're trying to do is get a few people that you love onto the helicopter. But if this is a battle for the future of the world, which is possible for the Christian worldview to win, then we ought to be prepared for that. Hmm. So, Pastor, I think that's a very good response, and a lot of people might think to themselves, well, that is true, but perhaps the solution is to isolate ourselves and build our own communities and sort of defend ourselves from state predation. But watching your show and and watching and reading some of your books, you're not quite au fait with that idea. You think we have to be a bit more muscular with what can be achieved. Yes, Uh, and the reason is, if we were... If we were Puritans in the 1600s and we were being persecuted, it was then possible to go to America. There, there was somewhere to go. Hmm. But where are we going to go now? We're going to go to the moon? Uh, you know, the, the, the tentacles of this woke, critical approach are everywhere. And we're going to have to take a stand somewhere. And we're going to have to counterattack somewhere. So basically, in the Reformation, the, the reformers, when they were talking about resisting evil from the magistrate, they had three stages that they developed. One was to be a prophetic voice against the evil, to testify, testify against it, preach against it, to be a, a bold witness. That was number one. Number two was to flee, if, assuming there was somewhere to go. Jesus, and it's honorable. Jesus said, if you persecute in one city, flee to the next. So that's perfectly fine. And then the third one was to, as a last resort, take up defensive arms. You never may, you you may never try to overthrow the existing authorities. We're we're not revolutionaries. But there there comes a time when your back's against the wall and there's nowhere to go and they're going to come and take your wife and kids. You say, no, let me think about it, no. Hmm. Do you think we get into those times, personally? I, y- yes, and I think that the last two years have revealed that the left is prepared to shoot the moon. They're, they're prepared to go a lot faster than, actually, if I were an advisor to them, 
I would be telling them to slow way down because I think they're overreaching. I think they're trying to grab too much too quickly. But it's part of the revolutionary spirit to be in, to be impatient. I think that's part of what revolution is, is impatience. Christians are reformers, which means, as Christopher Dawson once said, the Christian church lives in the light of eternity and can afford to be patient. We, we can play the long game because God is our general and he knows the end from the beginning. But the revolutionary has nothing but this life. And he went, you know, what do we want revolution? When do we want it? Now. That's, that's, a, that's their problem. So, so consequently, I think they're going to try to grab a lot more than I think they ought to. And I think that we're going to have to be active in our resistance. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think the cause of this is? Where do you think it's originating from? I think it comes straight from the pit of hell. <laughs> I've, 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 basically, this is, um, if, if you want to speak in earthly terms, I think the central besetting sin that's driving the progressive left is envy. I, and uh, I think that Christian churches have gone soft in how we've not been preaching against envy uh, for uh, several generations. We've not identified it as the great evil that it is. And now envy is instantiated as public policy. Uh, um, and and I think that that's the, that's the thing that's driving it, at least on a human level. Hmm. Yeah, I think envy is very important. Uh, because in South Africa, there, there's a hell of a lot of envy based on what has happened in the past. Uh, so for those who might not know, there was forced separation at a state level in South Africa for close to 40 years. Uh, black people were not considered citizens or deemed to have equal rights to white South Africans. And now that the that state has fallen over and the new regime has emerged 30 years ago, the roles have been reversed for the most part. And the inherent political power of the new regime is one of envy to this day. The envy yes. of... The whites did this, the envy of the whites accumulating resources, the envy of whites doing X, Y, Z. And there is no sin so bad that, that a black South African can be held responsible for it. But a, mm. a, a small deviation from the path is enough to persecute a white South African, at least in public yes. policy, maybe not in law as such. No, so, I, I think that I mean, that's, the real problem that's is, exactly right. Go ahead. No, he was waiting for you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, sorry, boss. Uh, yeah, the, prop, the, the uh, challenge of envy is, let's say if, if we went back to the days of apartheid in South Africa, which was sort of uh, putting the burner on high on the stove and, and tightening the pressure cooker lid, um, this, the state of affairs where you're now, that you're now confronting was sort of inevitable given that. But let's say that in the days of apartheid, let's say that blacks were given the franchise once they, let's say you did it gradually and they were given the franchise when they owned property and when they had a certain amount of money in the bank, they had something to protect. They were investing in the future of the country themselves. On the one hand, that would have that would have uh, enabled uh, blacks to advance themselves, but it would have made the envy problem worse, not better. Right? You you, you can't you you can't scratch your way out of envy. <laughs> the, mm. the the more you fight and bite and devour, the the worse it gets. Ramon, you had another question. So no, I think that is correct. So I mean, essentially, as, as you confirmed uh, in in your work, that we are basically under judgment right now, especially America and the West, and I would yeah. say South Africa as well in, in this regard. Um, how do we get out of judgment, in, in a material sense? Yeah, in a basically, um, the thing that we have to do is this is a public judge. I think you're right. This is a public judgment. And, and the answer to judgment is always repentance. And since it's a public judgment, I think the repentance needs to be public. But 
the repentance can't be kind of repentance, uh, the, the kind of apologies that the left is demanding, right? Um, and that's the, the subtlety that Christians are not um, grasping. So the left demands that we apologize for slavery or apologize for apartheid or apologize for, you know, all these historic uh, sins and failings in the West. But those aren't the sins that have brought down the judgment upon us now, right? Um, the, those, those were sins which were judged in their day, right? Uh, the American war between the states was a severe judgment on our entire country. Um, and it sh should have been responded to with repentance. What we need to do is repent of our current sins, public sins. We need to repent of our envy. We need to repent of infanticide. We need to repent of abortion. We need to repent of same-sex mirage. And, and yet so the Christians who are calling for public repentance are not calling for repentance for the sins that we're currently committing. We, we need to repent of what we're currently doing. Hmm. It's interesting that you say that because let's use, and I'm glad you kind of referenced it, let's use the argument of slavery. You know, the, the, the West has claimed, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm from Britain. I'm, I was born in South Africa, but I spent a large amount of my life in Britain. So Britain is no, how should we say, strangers to these arguments. But as you know, even from a UN level, the UN now is debating whether or not the Western countries are African countries and the black the black, the black nations in specific, whether or not they owe them reparations. And I suppose the, the thing that a lot of people seem to forget is that Britain itself actually paid for reparations 300 years ago. They ran an entire armada to stop the trade of slaves mm -hmm. over the seas. They fought an entire war over it. In fact, the slaves in the United States, what typically tends to get forgotten is that Britain actually paid for this, their, their, their freedom. They, reconsent, they they recompensated a lot of the slave owners in the in America for their freedom. So Britain has already paid the price. But I suppose what also gets glossed over as well is that more white people have been sold into slavery than black people over a large amount of time. And actually, if you look at it, even from the Asian side, a lot of the Asian countries continued to engage in slave trade well after the Western countries did. And yet the sin seems to remain dedicated to the Western countries and specifically the white countries and the whites in general. It seems to be like right. that's a sin that cannot be, should we say, espunged. And it's a, it's, a, it's a sins of, it's definitely a sins of the fathers that, or the grandfathers that seems to kind of be generational. And is there, is there a way to get out of it? Is, or is it just a never ending yeah. circle of nothingness? Yeah, I think it's a never ending circle unless and until we repent of the envy that's driving it. Okay, so you, you point correctly to a couple of things. Um, the, the first is that uh, the great Thomas Sowell, a uh, black economist, has pointed this out, and that is slavery is, has been ubiquitous, universal in human history. It's, it's something human beings universally have done, and it's just been the way of life, and the Roman Empire, ancient empires uh, in the Muslim countries, and in the 19th century, the West, unique among civilizations, eradicated slavery. And Britain, at great cost to themselves, suppressed the global slave trade. Uh, they, they uh, under the leadership of Wilberforce, they outlawed it in their own dominions first, and then used their fleet to shut slavery down. And so the so why is it that we're saying the first civilization uniquely to eradicate slavery, fighting costly wars in order to do it, is somehow uniquely guilty of slavery? Slaves were still held in Saudi Arabia down to the 1960s legally. So, uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing is to point out there was a thriving slave trade off the north coast of Africa at the same time that blacks were being sold in the Middle Passage to the New World off the west coast of Africa. Uh, Muslims were conducting a slave trade off the north coast, conducting raids as far north as Ireland. Uh, the word slave itself comes from Slavs, 
right? So, so um, the Slavic peoples were enslaved, and there were millions that were enslaved over the course of time. So consequently, if if we're going to uh, demand reparations, what what's the start date? When and and why do we just uniquely pick on one group only? Well, that's that's because that's the group you're trying to overthrow. That's that's the civilization you're trying to destroy. That that's why the reparations are being selectively applied. Yeah, I agree entirely. Yeah, uh, so do I. But but just back to Edvi Pastor, just very quickly. I think uh, as uh, people who are Christians or who call themselves Christians, they understand what causes envy. And maybe I'm mistaken in this regard, but envy is basically a reaction to missing something internal to yourself. So therefore, you will react to that outside world with malice if you yourself feel less than everyone else, one would assume. So if that is the right. correct way to describe envy, the solution to it seems to be, to me at least, um, become Christian or become religious in some way. Find meaning in your life, hopefully metaphysically as well. Yes, the, and I think you're right. But I, I would want to add, I think there's a one-two punch with that. Um, the, the person who is envious has an ache or a vacuum or a void in, inside them. They're wanting to fill which I would, as a preacher, I would say, well, turn to Christ. You know, let let Christ forgive you. Um, call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's a metaphysical assumption about the world that the envious can uh, draw on, and they frequently do draw on it. And this gets into economics. And that is the assumption that the world is a zero-sum game. Okay, if I if I assume that the world is a zero sum game, and the world is a pie, and you get a bigger piece of pie, if the pie is fixed, that means a bigger piece for you means a smaller piece for me. All right, so I look at the wealthy, I look at the the people the people who are advantages I don't have, and I assume if I'm if I have a zero sum mentality, that that's their wealth is the cause of my poverty. Their big piece of pie is the cause of my small piece of pie. But God is a giving God. God is a generous God. And God has created a world in which the pie grows. So I would much rather have a smaller piece of a growing pie than a larger piece of a shrinking one. Right? Uh, so if, the, uh, if, if wealth accumulates and compounds and, and the available resources and the standard of living is growing, I would, I would rather have a little sliver of a piece of pie that's 10 times bigger than the other one than a quarter of the pie that is the, the constant static size. And so if you've got that metaphysical assumption on the one hand, and then you have the ache that you reference, the, the lack, the ravenous lust that the unforgiven heart has, and you combine those two, the results are deadly. Yeah, and I, I suppose my my comment to that would be using the same kind of analogies. The, in the modern the modern psyche, what we're seeing right around the world is obviously everything's around redistributive policies. Everybody believes that there's a zero-sum game, and the approach to the zero-sum game is not the one that we have been seeing in the West for the last, say, 50 years since World War II, which is let's create bigger pie and allow, you know, free market capitalism to allow people to have a better standard of life, which ultimately is, has worked. But what we're now seeing is that people don't kind of believe in that. I suppose you could argue it was since 2008, the financial crash, but I think it probably predates that personally. Um, and if you look at it, the, the policies that we're seeing around the world, world is kind of, kind of like don't, don't bake a bigger pie because that, that kind of takes work and you may actually have to like be in the kitchen for a bit and it's much easier to take the existing pie and just cut it a little bit smaller I mean that's far easier right yeah. right it's, it's easy and it's lazy and then when the disastrous end result happens like what's happened to Venezuela or uh, what's happening now to California you can always, the envy can always find a culprit somewhere else. 
They can mm. they're always scapegoat it. And they can say, well, uh, so California outlawed, uh, they're phasing out outlawing gas powered vehicles. And now they're worried about the electric grid and telling people not to plug in their electric cars. And they're blaming it on climate change. They're not, they're not blaming it on their own foolish policies. They're blaming it on climate change. There's always going to be some sort of scapegoat somewhere. Yeah, I agree. My concern, though, for me personally, and before Ramon, you can ask your question in a sec. My concern, though, is that, and I say this to Ramon quite a bit, it feels a bit like we're back in the 1920s. You know, we obviously know history is circular, and whilst we don't repeat, we, we don't learn from our mistakes, we generally tend to repeat them. And it feels very much to me like we're back in the 1920s. You know, we've just seen the Wall Street crash. We've just seen, you know, the Nazis come to power. They've just invaded, uh, invaded Austria. People aren't really sure how to respond to this. And the, the Jews are kind of like the number one enemy of the state now, except kind of we've had the economic crash because of Biden's green policies. We've had Russia invade uh, Ukraine. And whiteness, as it's now being termed, not just white people, but whiteness is now the new Jews. It's like the new kind of buzzword. So is there not an inherent danger that, you know, that the most dangerous man they say now is in, in all countries, not just the United States, is a person who's white, male, heterosexual, and Christian, like not, you're like the enemy of the state. If you if you're that, is there not a is there not a risk that we're we're the new scapegoats? Um, it's not it's not just a risk. It's I think a standing reality. That's where we are. That's where we are right now. And uh, I think that one of the things that we have to do is articulate that that's where we are. So uh, just last week, when President Biden gave that. Uh, godforsaken speech, you know, with all the all the Nazi trimmings, uh, that was just absolutely appalling. And Christians need to recognize, wake up, and recognize where we actually are. Uh, mm. We we can't wait until the the door of the prison cell is almost completely swung shut. We have to we have to wake up now. Address mm. it now. Resist now. Just, just for members of us of our audience, the the speech you were, you were referring was the was the one. Biden has his hands raised up like this behind a, a red wall where he had two guards behind him, and he claimed that if you were voting for the American right, the Republicans, you were basically an extremist and an enemy of the state. That one, right? That yeah. one. It was just breath. It was breathtaking. Uh, it was so bad that a sort of grandeur crept into it. <laughs> Yeah, Ramon. So, Pastor Doug, a, a question uh, in terms of trying to bridge the gap between free markets, which which I think I believe in, but there's a few issues with them, and sort of retaining your your faith or or, or the Christian faith generally, because if the free market allows for people to choose, right? And and generally speaking, if a population is relatively lacking in any physical spiritualness, they will choose modernity, they'll choose sterile things, they will choose consumerism, they'll choose uh, 15 second videos on TikTok. And, and all yeah. these are the consequences of the free market, all these are consequences of the ability for people to choose what they wish. And once we have choice, arguably, we become a lot lazier than when we do not have choice. I'm not speaking about having a dictator in place. But how do you balance? free markets and the consequences yeah. to building a thriving Christian ethic to the widest possible well, audience. I would I say that at a certain level, you don't have to worry about it because if you have a lazy dissipated people who are, all they're doing is consuming cat videos and uh, buying marijuana and, and signing up on porn sites, if that's the population, you're not going to have capitalism for more than 15 minutes anyway, because uh, capitalism de depends upon a hardworking, virtuous people. So our, our second president, John Adams, once said of our constitution, I would say the same thing is true of free market economic systems. Uh, he said our constitution presupposes a moral and a religious people is wholly unfit for any other. So, and I would say that the same thing is true of free market economics. If you, if you have a society of porn addicts 
or a society of lotus eaters or a society of lazy welfare check recipients, you don't, you're not going to have capitalism. And you, or you will have capitalism for a short time while it's in decline, where people are spending their money on worthless things. But if you have an if, if there's a great reformation and revival, the people turn to God, repent of their sins, and then start working hard, you're going to have a free market. So I, I like to put it this way, free grace, free men, free markets in, in that order. Mm, interesting. That's a very good rebuttal. Thank you, Pastor. Mm, absolutely. I mean, in, in, your, in your opinion then, I mean, looking at it obviously in a woke West in the world that we now live in, what, what does it mean anymore even to consider yourself Christian? Now, I asked that question for a reason, and that is because I've watched a lot of your debates, and I love them. I think you're the most patient man I've ever met in my entire life. Like The, 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 the stuff that gets thrown at you, uh, I think you, you deserve a, a Nobel Peace Prize for some of the stuff that gets thrown at you. I watch some of your debates, and I just like how you don't just go, I'm out of here. I, I don't know. Like Patience of a saint. But I suppose one of the things that commonly I see, and I think Roman sees this too, is just how often you encounter in your own debates what I would only describe as a liberal progressive church where the gospel has been replaced by the gospel of secularism. And kind of like, for me personally, I wonder how much of this you could maybe even trace to the, the Billy Graham movement, which obviously was very influential in spreading Christianity throughout the United States, but it made it popular. And because it made it popular, it kind of relied on a populist feeling. And that populist feeling kind of has led modern people to kind of still want to be involved in, let's call it popular type culture. It doesn't, it doesn't require any of the great sacrifices that, that it requires to be a Christian in the modern world. And so as a result, it's like it's far, far easier to, rather than take the sacrifice point of saying, well, this is my faith and this is what I believe in, it's far easier for you to say, well, it's kind of popular to kind of believe this. So, you know, and then what they do is they read that teaching backwards into the Gospels and it's like, okay, now the Gospel believes this, even though it really doesn't. I, I, it then leads me to kind of question, like, what's it even mean to be a Christian in the modern world anymore? Like, people are killing it. They're killing the gospel. Yeah. So I would say that the, the difficulty with the evangelical Arminianism, as represented by Billy Graham, is, is not what it said or taught, or I'm, I'm grateful for all the people who came to Christ through his ministry, but my complaint would be it didn't go far enough. So art is not, it's not how far it went or, or all the cities he preached in or all the people who repented. Uh, the tagline that we use in for our ministries here is all of Christ for all of life. So we want to be Christian Monday morning after church. We want to be Christians on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday all through the week. And that means we want to find out what the Bible teaches on economics. What does the Bible teach on uh, uh, garbage disposal? What does the Bible teach on caring for the environment? What does the Bible teach on all of these things? So it's not just a matter of me repenting of my sins so that I can go to heaven when I die. And I think that what happened was a lot of people got saved so here in America, we have millions, millions of professing evangelical Christians who don't know how to apply the Bible to the most glaring, glaringly obvious cultural problems, like abortion or same-sex mirage. We don't know how to apply the Bible to those things because mm -hmm. we're muddled on those things. Come on. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. So, so just for, for clarity, Pastor, I'm a sort of agnostic who is seeking so i know you said there's two types of agnostics those who don't seek and those who do seek uh so i mean i've been mm -hmm. baptized in the catholic church i've i've drifted away for for a number of years but i'm seeking my way back uh, in, in some sense in, in time to come and okay it 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 it, it does appear that uh, when i when i do go to church or i go to people's weddings religion is like sort of the last thing that you see at a Catholic church, at least. When I go to weddings, it's it's literally just a process. Repeat after me, these are the words, thank you, bye. 
But there's no imbibing of the actual ethics or the metaphysics of right. what a marriage is anymore. It's right. like the church has become modern, which is extremely sad yeah. and needs to be changed. Yeah, the church has become modern, and it's become little more than a sort of a, a religious decoration or trinket that y you do this thing that the state requires you to do um, because they've got to sort out property disputes and custody disputes. And so you do this little religious decoration. It's sort of like the bride's dress, or it's some sort of um, add-on extra. But when we... Uh, conduct a wedding here. It's a covenant ceremony. Covenant vows are exchanged. I'm there as a minister of the gospel. I give a homily or a, a sermon or an address on the meaning of the covenant that we're about to uh, witness. And then the couple exchange vows. And then I announce that on the basis of these vows, you are now husband and wife. You may kiss your bride. So it's got to be it's got to be religious from beginning to end because all of life is religious from beginning to end. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's a, that's a fantastic way of, of explaining that. I suppose for me, I wonder where the, how should we say the, the lack of religion comes into people. And I wonder if it's, if it's more an ec educational point of view, it's funny how many, you know, I, I did my master's in systematic theology at King's College London, and I did, a, I did my thesis under uh, Alistair McGrath, who's a great apologist. So mm -hmm. I'm sure you, yeah. you, you know McGrath's work. So very great, great guy. <laughs> very, very weird to talk to. <laughs> like, loses attention very quickly, but fantastic guy. But um, the... It was always very interesting speaking to some of the priests that would come in and out of seminary and they would come through for, for various forms of training and you would always say to them things about this, just call it like theology or even Christian ethics. And a lot of them were like, oh, I'm not really interested in that. It doesn't really interest me. It's a bit too hard to kind of think about. I'm far more interested in just kind of like pastoral and ministry type things, you know, just praying for my congregation. And as Nash Ramon rightly points out, going through the motions and is, is there not a danger that that's kind of like the way that the modern church has become? It's become kind of like, a, let's call it a counselor, a counselor type service with a, with a little bit of cultural niceties. But what it actually means, like the strict cultural ethics, the, the strict codes of religion and, and the hardcore kind of like, this is actually really what I believe and, and what it really means to be a Christian. Is, isn't there a risk that that's all just like gone? Yeah, it's, a, it's more than a risk. Again, it's here. So if I said, I want to be a pastoral counselor for the people in my church, but nobody can bring me any problems that exceed the bounds of 45 minutes out of a given week, <laughs> I'm, I'm limiting my counsel to this part of your life and as measured by time or by subject matter. I will mm -hmm. counsel you on marriage problems or child-rearing problems but I won't counsel you on how to respond to dictatorial uh, demands by your woke corporate employer. Or I won't, I won't counsel you on what to do if you're in the military and they're demanding that you get the vaccine. Or I won't, I, I won't counsel you on all the areas that are bothering you, um, th that, that are challenging you. What kind of pastoral care is that? Well, I, I would call it negligent. Uh, uh, at uh, some levels, it's just criminal negligence. What you're doing is your pastors are saying to their people, I will be your spiritual advisor on how to manage your personal quiet time, your personal Bible devotional reading time. I'll help you with your prayer schedule. Um, but all the things that are afflicting the people, that are challenging them, overwhelming them, threatening their livelihoods, threatening their families, Oh, the church is no help at all. That and and that's just simply atrocious. I agree, and I've, I'm so glad you kind of took it that kind of approach. I, I knew you would, so it, it's allowed me to expand this brilliantly because that's exactly coming back to what I said previously, where I said, you know, isn't there the 
this is what I see in modern churches. Like a lot of them, that type of advice that you're talking about, talking about right there, what the church, the church will do, will default to the state's position. So it would be like, okay, I'm not going to advise you of that. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to advise you now. We're going to give you the position of the true religious class, which is the state. So the state says, take your vaccine. The state says there's more than two genders. The state says, you know, equality amongst all people and you must allow anybody to get married in your church whether or not you believe it so it's much easier to default those actual proper theological treaties to the state whilst you kind of continue to pretend to be the counselor right and i see that a lot in yeah. your type of q a that you do i see i see that tons yes that's ab- that's absolutely the case and this is because christians christian pastors don't see themselves first and fundamentally as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven all the time. I'm not a citizen of the kingdom of heaven during the Sunday morning worship service only. No, I've, um, Augustine t- taught us that we need to have our affections rightly ordered. So I'm an American all the time, and I'm a Christian all the time, and I need to know what outranks what. You know, if, if I have a genuine authority over me in my government, but I have an ultimate authority over me in my God and in the scriptures. What do I do when they come to conflict? All right. So it's, if I'm growing up, if I'm a kid, what do I do if my dad tells me to do something and my older sister tells me to do something different? Well, I need to know who outranks who. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's a point of hierarchy. Ramon loves to yeah. say that. Ramon loves to always say it's not a point point of anything else but hierarchy. Yeah, it's not hypocrisy, yeah. it's hierarchy. <laughs> but, but speaking of hypocrisy, uh, Pastor Doug, I'm not, I'm not accusing you thereof, please. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's based on the question I have. So my, a lot of people, some might say, you know, centrist, normal, reasonable people might say, well, maybe it's good that the church has lost its centralized power or its political power because our concern as rational, reasonable people who might have some sort of cultural Christian values, but not overtly uh, religious, might think to themselves, thank goodness the church has less power now, because otherwise it would just be Westboro Baptist Church times 100. And I know that you detest those sort of people. I know you really do. So if there are people out there who may be agnostic, uh, what, what what is the fundamental aspect of your church versus something awful like Westboro Baptist Church that clearly yeah. delineates the two. So I would I would point to uh, two things. I would respond at two levels. One is a distinctively Christian political theory uh, and distinctively Protestant political theory budgets for the depravity of man and budgets for the depravity of religious man. So um, what you do, if you, if you read through the American Constitution, which was formed in, uh, in the light of Protestant political theory, one of the things that you're going to realize is that uh, the, American, the fundamental premise of the American Constitution is this. You should never, ever trust an American. Right? Uh, we're we're going to spread the power as thinly as possible. We're going to have checks and balances. We're going to have a two-tiered federal system where the, the states have this amount of power. The national government has a certain amount of power, but the national government is going to be divided up into three branches. The legislative branch is going to have two branches for that, and the judicial has another. And, the, they've all, and we're going to write it all down in the Constitution so that everybody is jealously guarding their own prerogatives. So what, basically what a, a Christian political theory does is it limits the government. It, because it, it, we, we're very aware, acutely aware of the sinfulness of man. And just because he's a religious authority uh, or a pope doesn't make him any less susceptible to the temptations of power. So uh, that's the first thing. A, a, a robustly Christian political theory is going to set up firewalls or safeguards against the Westboro Baptists being able to run amok. That, so that's the first thing. 
the second the second thing is if we go back we we should look at where we actually are if we go back over all of church history and try to find the worst example of christians behaving badly <laughs> right um the Westboro Baptist times 10. I would probably come up with something like the Spanish Inquisition. Okay? The Spanish Inquisition would be probably the, my exhibit A for Christians behaving badly in the name of Christ. That was really, really, really bad. So, it, uh, so I, I, nothing I'm about to say here is defending in any way the Spanish Inquisition because I detest it, hate it. Um, but over the history of the Spanish Inquisition, about 2,000 people were killed. Okay? About 2,000 people were murdered or unjustly executed under the Spanish Inquisition. 2,000 people. That is Stalin on a slow afternoon. Mm. Okay? So the, the progressive left that is going to deliver us from Westboro Baptists you know, ruining the world, the progressive leftists over the course of a century have been responsible for a hundred million murders, mm -hmm. right? Um, our, the, society, the century we just emerged from was the bloodiest in human history. And it was, it was atheistic, secular materialism that did it. And so when modern secular materialist atheists rise up and say they're going to deliver us from all the bloodshed, Christians have been guilty of down through history. I think Christians ought to confess our sins, and there have been some bad things, you know, Salem witch trials and the Spanish Inquisition and the Fourth Crusade. There have been some bad things, but nothing, I mean nothing compares to how evil these current leftists are, what they're responsible. So, Pastor, I actually watched uh, only today your, your uh, reaction to Sam Harris speaking about this. Ah. And say so the difference between Sam Harris and Stalin is that Stalin is a better logician. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he knows fundamentally God doesn't exist and he acts accordingly. Sam Harris yeah. knows, in quotation marks, that God doesn't exist but wishes that he does. Yeah. That's the most and interesting point. And wants to act point. like he does. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Mm. I'm not saying but, Sam Harris is a murderer. I'm just saying he's a Christian yeah, atheist. I, I, I'm like, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. The, the, the funny thing is, like, how much of this do you think you can trace back? Like, even what we're facing now to the rise of the, you know, what they called the four horsemen. So obviously, how, how much of it could you could you personally say we can see even in the lack of religious identity, even in the modern modern young kids? Like, we're clearly seeing as Elon Musk described it, the woke mind virus taking its, its toll in the younger generation. How much do you think that we could possibly attribute to, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and uh, oh, the other guy, the old guy with the beard. Yeah. I forget his yeah. name. Yeah, Dennett. Um, Dennett, that's it. I don't think, I, I think that they are more symptoms of the problem than causes. I don't think they caused it. I think, uh, the, at least in my country, I think the fundamental uh, causal agent in all of this has been the public school system, the government school system, mm -hmm. which initially set up shop to provide education for everyone who could be against that, right, that sort of thing. The founders of the movement were Unitarian progressive unbelievers. And when the government school system was established here in America, they were controlled. The schools were controlled by the local uh, school boards, which were Protestant and evangelical. So the mm. schools, the schools were um, uh, a Trojan horse. So uh, Christians were trained to think of the uh, were trained to think of the schools as somehow our schools, uh, but the. That's not how it turned out. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we've seen this right across the West now, aren't we? Like, the schools have all been captured by left-wing ideologies. We're seeing it right across the professional environments. A lot of the schools now are deeply inundated in, in left-wing kind of critical theory. Um, yeah. And a lot of people for a long time said, well, it's just schools. I mean, you know, what harm can you have? 
But what we're seeing is that those people would end up becoming professionals in the public environment because the state wants to be the primary employer. And as a result of that, what we are seeing is that some of these policies are becoming a reality, aren't we? Yeah. So whenever you see students rioting and throwing bricks through shop windows, you say, that kid graduated from somewhere. <laughs> mm, that's right. right. Somebody, somebody taught him what the good life was. Somebody taught him how to think or how, how it was not necessary to think. Uh, so we, we need to realize that God is not mocked. Um, a man reaps what he sows. Cultures also reap what they sow. You can't plant thistles and harvest barley. Yeah, I'd completely agree with you. Completely agree. Roman? So, uh, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, speaking of culture, uh, the Roe v. Wade was overturned at the Supreme Court. Uh, much to, well, no one's surprised really because it was bad law when it was first uh, ruled upon yes. in, the, I believe it was the 70s. Do you think there are any cultural shifts that will emerge from this or do you just think it's it's something technically legal that the state is going to just overrun anyway in time to come through legislation or things like that? Or do you think it's culturally it's uh, vitally important that this happened? No, it, it was a major victory for the good guys. Um, it was just a glorious thing. If we, we don't have our church building built yet, but if we did and we had our church bell, uh, it would have been ringing all day. Um, and this, doesn't, this didn't eradicate abortion in America. At the end of this process, there's going to be a couple of years of fighting, but at the end of the process, abortion will be against the law, I think, in about half states. All right, so um, I, I think we've made a, a major uh, beachhead. Um, uh, it's just, I, it's be hard for me to overstate how significant I think this was. Especially one of the, so it's not just that uh, half the states can now, are now in a position to outlaw abortion, which I think they will or greatly restrict it. It also is a great encouragement to uh, non-believers. It was a great, uh, excuse me, a great encouragement to believers, I mean, to uh, to realize, oh, we, we've been fighting this battle since 1973, and it was a full generation, but we won, right? Uh, and G.K. Chesterton once said that uh, there's one taste of paradise on this earth, and that is to fight in a losing cause and then not lose. Mm. And that's that's how this feels. Ramon? So actually, going on to that, you mentioned Chesterton. How do you reconcile yourself, Pastor, with your love of Chesterton, your love of Tolkien, and your Calvinism? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, like I, I like to say, uh, Charles Spurgeon once asked how he reconciled his belief in divine sovereignty and his belief in human freedom. And he says, I don't. I never reconcile friends. Um, so uh, uh, Chesterton never missed an opportunity to take a swing at Calvinism. He, you know, he, he once said that Calvinism was the least Christian of all the Christian systems. But I'm, I'm currently working on a book uh, called Chestertonian Calvinism, where I'm, uh, I'm wanting to show uh, the deep harmony between Calvinism and the basic Chestertonian outlook. Now, that, I can't do that without saying that Chesterton himself was inconsistent on this point, but I think C.S. Lewis understood Chesterton better on this than Chesterton himself did, because um, in selected literary essays, when he's, uh, Lewis says that the Puritans, the 17th century uh, Puritans, or maybe 16th century Pur the Puritans, at, at any rate, he says were far more Chestertonian uh, than their adversaries. Uh, so I believe the first 100 years of the Protestant Reformation was a time of Chestertonian exuberance that was brought about by forgiveness of sin. Um, and later, I think there was there were some Protestants who became kind of stuff shirt peck sniffians but er, and initially i don't think it was that way hmm. 
I got to I got to take it off uh, to a different topic now. I know we're going to run out of time soon, and uh, I'll, there's still so much I want to ask you. So actually, I want to take it on to something else that I've, I've listened to you talk about quite a bit. It's actually a topic I love to actually listen okay. to you talk about, which is actually modern masculinity, specifically masculinity in the eyes of of, of Christian ethics. Obviously, you you've once said that uh, okay. the point of being a husband and a father is is that of being the sacrifice in the family. So. Explain explain that a little bit more. Okay. Like how how do you how do you feel how do you see modern masculinity in, in the environment we live in now? Okay, so I believe that modern men largely have been uh, emotionally and spiritually castrated. Uh, I believe that we're populated by uh, drones and eunuchs. Uh, I just don't. And then uh, there's some people, some men, who have revolted against that and have gone into the secular manosphere where it's sort of a machismo kind of reaction. So there's, uh, I think, a generation of feminism has resulted in um, deboning uh, men so that their masculinity is not appreciated. And then some men have overreacted away from that and tried to, you know, beat their chests and start doing, you know, blowing things up and just doing it, trying to react that way. I, I believe the only real answer to this is a biblical masculinity. And, and I define that biblical masculinity as masculinity is the glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility. So uh, I believe that a man should be the wall between a hard world and his family. He, he needs to be the kind of person who um, will just lay down his life. Husband, and th this is what the Apostle Paul teaches. Um, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her. That's biblical masculinity. Mm. And I think that's a, it's a very valid and, and very useful definition. But you have two things or well, three things actually that the modern world detests sacrifice responsibility and being glad to do both <laughs> yes yeah so uh, when a husband lays his life down for his wife and family he can't do it grumbling it's the it's the glad assumption of sacrificial mm -hmm. responsibility he he has to recognize this is why god made me the way i am um, this is what I'm for. This is how I'm to give myself away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So husbands, uh, husbands have authority in the home. I believe the husband is the head of the home. Husbands have authority in the home. But we have to always remember that in Scripture, authority is a bleeding authority. Christ bled for us. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting way to look at it. It's like the modern the modern left doesn't like that idea because it takes away it dis in their eyes it disenfranchises women to have any form of response or power in the house. And as you know, in everything in modern leftist ideology is just all about power structures, right? So it's like you know right. if you if you take away the power of the woman, but it's like it's not it's not really how it works. Though. It's like you could say that the husband comes ahead of the household, but it isn't really stripping of the wife of power is it it's not really the way it works no, no not at all it, it, paul says that the the man is the image of the glory of god and the woman is the glory of man right so and and proverbs says that a godly woman is the crown of her husband so the husband is the head but the wife is the crown <laughs> that's, come on that's, there's not, this is not a disparaging view of woman at all. Um, so, and when you go back to Corinthians, where the woman is the glory, the man is the glory of God, and the woman is the glory of the glory. It's sort of like the holy of holies. Um, mm. It's a superlative. The woman is the glory of the glory. And so, when a man does what he ought to do, he honors his wife. So, in Peter, the Apostle Peter says that um, husbands honor your wives. All right, you you're 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 not supposed to uh, say, "Oh, you're the weaker vessel, so I disparage you." He says, "Honor." Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, 
I think there's a lot of people that, that, that take, that, that just decontextualize history to such a degree where it's all about power for over mm -hmm. 10,000 years or whatever the case might be of human existence. It's like, uh, it is, it's obvious that women were hated. It's obvious that men were more powerful. It's obvious that all these different power structures built up over time. But when you look back, you just say to yourself, no, they, these, are, these are people trying to survive under much harsher conditions than you, right? And, and survival means division of labor. Survival means protecting. The survival means being able to do things without hopefully getting killed or harm in the process. I mean, survival yes. creates order. It creates a hierarchy. It creates something that wasn't there mm. before. It's not just hating each other or man hating women, therefore they're lower. It's a bit, uh, you know, it's pretty just, and it's really yeah. silly, but it's so popular as a theory for some reason. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yes. there's, I think yeah. that this, this has been, I heard, um, I know you probably won't be familiar with him, but I know Ramon will. Uh, Sargon talked about this as well, Ramon, where he basically said men, men, men are the, or women are the gatekeepers of sex in a relationship, but man is the gatekeeper of a relationship. Both have a gate, both are gatekeeping, both have something that the other wants. There isn't really one that's more powerful than the other. Like man wants sex and the woman wants a relationship. So you, you can't look at them as being a power structure like that. And it, and it's a great, it is another great way of looking at it. Yes, and I, I would take this back to our earlier discussion of zero-sum thinking. When the, when the left thinks of everything in terms of power structures, they're thinking of just so much authority and power to go around, and more for you means less for me. Mm -hmm. But in, uh, in a godly relationship, uh, this is something else that goes along with masculinity is the assumption of sacrificial responsibility. Authority, uh, this is something I would add to that. Authority flows to those who take responsibility. So when a husband takes responsibility for his wife and for family, and he takes it gladly, and he takes it sacrificially, authority flows to him. But when authority flows to him, it's not flowing away from his wife. <laughs> right? The high grows. The, the, um, so a husband who's loving his wife, and his wife is returning uh, her respect and honor to him, the the amount of good stuff in that relationship is growing so when um when a husband loves his wife and the wife respects her husband at the end of you know on their 25th anniversary on their 50th anniversary uh they both have far more than either one of would either one of them would have had singly right, because the because what they have is is prospered and God makes it grow. Hmm. Interesting. So I, th I suppose I'd kind of move this on then to kind of like the next topic, which is obviously one that for me is, is something that Ramon and I talk about a lot on our on our own podcast, and it's something that we look to to promote quite a bit. And I know, and I, know I recently saw talked about this. this um, <laughs> you talked about it actually to do with uh, Joe Biden's speech and you talked, you told people don't fall into the trap. You clearly can see this as being a leftist type trap where they're hoping that some kind of, let's call it right winger somewhere might feel that they're intimidated and react. And then they'll use that as a, as a degree of power overreach where they can go, Oh, look, see, we need more power because right. you know, white supremacy right. and power. And you said, um, right. it might be your second amendment right to take uh, an AR 15 with you to go to your voting. But Maybe you shouldn't because the optics just weren't very, very good. So, yeah. as you know, the UN Charter, which is the UN is just basically a communist organization these days, but um, the U there's a UN Charter which basically seeks to disarm citizens of states and take away their guns. And we've seen that in South Africa as well. I mean, we have got uh, an organization here called uh, Gun Free South Africa that seems to have the ear of the police secretary. And that organization is actually a Soros-funded organization. And they seem to be trying to pursue ways to disarm individuals and take away their ability to have self-defense. Um, but this seems to be a worldwide thing, which again, if you remember our city, it feels a bit like we're in 1920s. It feels a little bit like the Weimar Republic and... You know the the Germans are trying to disarm the Jews, and they're implementing gun control. What's what's your mm -hmm. approach on on gun controls and access to firearms? Uh, guns are liberty's teeth. So, uh, basically, I don't think 
we ought to flaunt our right to keep and bear arms in a way that, you know, would enable, would provoke a reaction. But if they, if they, um, I'm not, you know, I'll put it this way. There's a lot of Americans who, if they send out um, an edict that you have to turn in your guns, a lot of Americans are going to say, you know, unfortunately, I lost all my guns in a fishing accident. <laughs> Uh, the cut on to our response. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, I've got I've got a number of guns, and uh, that basically I believe that I'm endowed by my Creator with certain inalienable rights, and the right to defend myself is one of those rights. And no government edict um, uh, can take that away. So, consequently. Uh, and, and fortunate, uh, this is very fortunate. There are, uh, I think there's something like three guns floating around for every American citizen. <laughs> it's like there's, there is no conceivable way that they are going to disarm the American uh, populace. It's, and just yet not it's just not going to happen. And yet they're trying. Like, they're but trying. that's not. That's not, yeah. it's not just an American thing. I mean, it's South, South Africa trying to come up with some rules that are like, you should see them. They're in the world of crazy. And, you know, I've got, I've got firearms in the UK, but you give the wrong podcast. It's actually relating to my next question anyway. But you give the wrong podcast in the UK and, like, the police knock at your door and they're like, uh, we don't deem you to be that safe anymore, so uh, can we have your guns, please? And uh, you don't really have any choice. You kind of have to give them back. No, no, you, no, you, no, you had that unfortunate fishing accident. <laughs> but if you don't report it in if you don't report it in the UK after a certain period, then that's it, man. It's like off to the slammer you go. You know they don't really give you much of an opportunity. But uh, talk, talking of don't the UK, report. yeah, talking of the UK, yeah. I don't know if you keep up with uh, much of the news there, but the hate the hate crime yeah. bills are quite are quite extreme. And there's been of recent there's been a number of uh, council rules. So councils are like your local kind of state level, I suppose. We call them municipalities in South Africa. There's been a number of street rules that are actually forbidding certain uh, Christian teachings and posterior teachings on on should we say what you I suppose you class as we call it council property, but you call it state property. So anywhere there's a highway, it's basically around like shopping districts and stuff like that. So the idea of having the evangelist stand in the streets, it's it's not allowed anymore because the number of and they're usually left wing constabulary or, or left wing councils. They're uh, making it illegal to give certain speeches because they class it as hate speech. What's your, what's your view on that? Well, my view is that secularism. And a materialistic, atheistic secularism is a worldview that does not generate a value for lib religious liberty or freedom of speech or freedom of thought or freedom of action. Li liberty is not something that grows out of the leftist worldview. Uh, the leftists can, can uh, utilize liberty in a parasitic way where the Christian worldview invented religious liberty. The Christian worldview uh, was the basis for f our, our freedoms of speech and s so forth. And the fact that those, uh, our, our understanding of those freedoms is being eroded is the consequence of the Christian worldview itself being eroded. So there's no, there's no way to transplant or graft the traditional liberties of the West onto a fundamental secular worldview. It's not going to happen. Mm. Uh, if, if we want those liberties, we have to have Christ. If we want those liberties, we must return to Christ. Mm. So uh, uh, my last question, Ramon, then I hand it over to you, man. So, and I, I kind of expected it to go this area, and I'm glad it did. So I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap up everything you've said. It's been great to talk to you. You're everything that we that we hope to be, and it was fantastic to speak. So, so to reiterate, you said about masculinity in a modern environment. You talked about being sacrificial in the house. We talked about liberty and freedom and guns, and we also talked about how you kind of need to have your worldview in order to be able to stand up for something. And I suppose the final question I have is, what do you think that means for us? Here we are, we white male men. 
and we don't necessarily the audience doesn't have to be white it can be any man it can be any individual here we are on the 21st century and we want to stand on for our liberty so what do you think we're called to do like what's what's your view what would you say to us okay i would i would say fundamentally this would be the first precondition um i would tell white heterosexual men to to not feel sorry for themselves okay don't don't play the victim it's ugly it's and there is not going to work anyway uh, mm. so basically i think we should be we should fight and resist like cheerful cavaliers we shouldn't fight like alt-right thugs on the one hand and we shouldn't whimper like a dog that's been beat too much i, I think we should stand up straight uh trust in christ and keep our powder dry i think we should say i don't know if this fight, this particular battle is going to be successful, but if I can quote a uh, uh, a centaur, the room with the centaur in the last battle, uh, his last words were uh, basically remember that an, a noble death is something that no one is too poor to buy. Right. So I think that we need to be have backbone, grow backbone. Trust in God, uh, don't feel sorry for ourselves, and just be cheerful warriors. Ramon. Cheerful warriors. I, I, maybe I should put that in my Twitter bio. It's very good. So, Pastor, just uh, two questions from me, but they'll be very quick. Uh, number one, doubt. Especially the last two years uh, after the COVID scam, um, <laughs> let's just call it that which is what I truly believe it is, a lot of people might be thinking to themselves, it seems rather hopeless, all this stuff. Uh, the, the world went completely crazy. My neighbors, you know, called the police because I didn't wear a mask in my garden. Uh, there, there's no real meaning to life anymore. And a lot of these people might be well-meaning Christians. You know, Christians in the Church of England sense, we're like, they're sort of Christian, once again, culturally, but maybe not strong believers. So, so and because not everyone has the same if I'm going to say fortitude as you have in this particular regard, how can we remove that doubt from well-meaning people to actually do stand up for themselves, do not take nonsense or, or offense or feel like they can be oppressed from elsewhere? Because I think that's I, yeah, I'd, really severely lacking. I'd want to map my answer this one onto my uh, answer to the previous question. I believe that if Christian leaders stand up straight as cheerful warriors and don't let them get you down and you just articulate the, the honest, plain truth, a lot of people that are uh, swayed by what the state is currently doing are going to be looking at that and they're going to think, is that allowed? <laughs> is that okay? Can you, why are you doing that? Um, we have seen many, many people, because of the stuff we've been doing online over the last two years, many people have moved here. Um, many people have contacted us and said, you've been a great encouragement. If I see somebody else doing what I wish I could do, then all of a sudden maybe I might find myself doing it. So uh, despair is a very deadly sin. So I'm a, I'm a Christian. <clears throat> they can't take the resurrection of the dead away from us, right? Jesus rose from the dead in the middle of history. He's going to raise all the dead at the end of history. And we don't have to worry about it. We, we can just say, I want to be faithful in my generation. I want to be faithful in my time. And then let God, duties are mine, results are God's. And I just want to leave the issue with him. And then do as best I can what I thought I'd be doing. And that no, will be encouraging to many. That will encourage many. No, I think so too. And I think it's a very good way to put it. And, and the strain that you have, Pastor, is the fact that you use all this modern media to, to push your message out. So, so Byron was aware of you for quite a while until he, he showed you, uh, well, he showed me rather, your your YouTube videos, most importantly. I've got a few friends in South Africa who, who also know you quite well. Uh, what, if any, uh, 
advice can you give to people who might be in a situation where they do want to emulate Pastor Doug Wilson in terms of finding the truth of the world and making sure people listen to that? How would they start by, you know, following your trend in terms of making sure that you use modern technology to do so? Rather than just be localized, you can be global. Yeah, I would say if, if the, it would depend. If they are just an average Christian father, let's say, I would say start by learning and making sure that your family, your, your kids are learning the same things you are. Don't learn on their behalf. Bring them along with you. If you're the pastor of a small church, then do the same with your parishioners. Bring them along. Teach on these things. Preach on them. Um, and then if you, are, if you are privileged to have a, a Christian community or a church that is more than 100 people, you can start being more visible or more vocal uh, online and start saying things. When they, when they tell you that you can't say something, say it. <laughs> if, they, if they say, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, well, do it. I, I think there has to be a, uh, uh, there has to be a place where there's a pinch point where, where they say, yeah, I'm, you may not, and I say, well, I'm gonna, no, I understand that. And I suppose, you know, there's one point that you said there that I really kind of want to focus on as a final point, And that is, you said, in the old days, when everything was going wrong, you could flee to the United States. And it's it's funny, because that's an approach that many South Africans have, like, I'm sure you're aware, there's a large number of white South Africans that immigrate this country every year. That trend is no longer now just confined to white South Africans, it's also now confined Black South Africans are immigrating, those with skills and those with financial means, they're immigrating too. And they're all seeking, let's call them sake favens, what you would have referred to as the, the United States of old. But from my, my perspective, and maybe it's because Ramon and I are too involved in politics, but there's no way really safe to go anymore, is it? Like everywhere's kind of like the same boat and you might think the grass is green on the other side, but uh, it's, not, it's not as clean as you think. And at some point in time, Russell of Sakhalika has a very famous thing, and you, you actually touched on a very similar theme. And that was at some point in time, you just have to stand your ground, build a trench, and fight a battle. Yeah, I think that's very true. I don't think everybody is called to immigrate or leave the current trouble spot. Some are called to stay and fight, some are called to leave. That's true. Just to, I was just interviewed yesterday, John Anderson, who's, a, who's got an Australian. Uh, podcast and and he was visiting here in America and he pointed something out which I think is very apt and very true. The United States is very divided. So if you took the blue, uh, if you took the uh, the blue coastal areas or places like Chicago, the woke um, blue areas of the United States, if they were their own country, would be wokest and the worst. All over the world, all right. If but if you come to the heartland of the United States and made that its own country, it's the best. Yeah. So the, the United States is currently housing the best and the worst. There, there, is, there really is a basis for resistance here, and there is active resistance. But there, if basically, um, if if we took. Uh, the woke areas of the United States and transplanted them to South Africa or to Europe, they'd be to the left of what's going on there, <laughs> what's going on there now. Uh, and, but if you took Oklahoma and put that in the middle of Europe or put that in South Africa, everybody would wonder where these Martians came from. Um, mm. you know, so ba basically, uh, as for South Africans who are relocating, there there are safe havens, there are places to relocate where that move makes sense. But if you're not if if you're not called to it, or if you're not able to relocate, you know, if God just closes the door, or if you feel called to be, you know, man the man the ramparts where you are, um, you should 
you should uh, conduct yourself in such a way that the, the good-hearted people around the world know that you're there doing what you're doing so that you have their prayers, financial support, material support. Um, basically, Christians, faithful Christians, need to be connected to one another. Yeah, good point. And don't be the victims. Don't, don't claim things that aren't okay. there. Stand up straight, put down some roots, and fight for what you believe in. That's a very old story. Yeah, absolutely. But repeated. Pastor, yeah. what we're a, not the first one. Sorry. My apologies. No, we're not the first generation that has, uh, has had to do this. No, exactly. and we, we try to remind our own audience of that all the time, but it's a, it's a, it's a message that kind of gets lost so quickly. Pastor, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And oh, I really, my pleasure. I enjoy talking to you. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to uh, to speak to little old us in South Africa and do do spare a thoughts and a prayer for us. And hopefully, we'll see yeah. speak to you again. And when you um, when you put this up or when it's online and available, please feel free to send it to us, and we'll broadcast. We'll kick it down the road. Fantastic. Appreciate Fantastic. it. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks very much. Okay. Ciao. God bless. See you. And you. Bye.